presentation of proactive health programs that fall in three categories, healthy eating and active living, smoke-free living, and healthy and safe built environment. As part of this initiative, a number of counties and communities in the state are working towards the baby-friendly hospital designation, and our organization, the Illinois chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Illinois Maternal and Child Health Coalition have been engaged to help provide technical support and education to those communities and those hospitals. And so this webinar is part of that initiative. Uh, we'll introduce the speakers in just a moment, but I want to let people know the webinar is an hour long. We should have 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions, and you can use the chat function in the webinar uh, software to enter a question at any time during the, the, the webinar, and we'll try and answer those at the end. So with that, I'd like to turn it over, thank IDPH, Illinois Department of Public Health, for the uh, support and for this initiative. And I'm going to turn it over to Mary Elsner, who's a project director here at ICAP, to introduce our first speaker. Hi, I'm Mary Elsner. I'm the director of obesity prevention initiatives at ICAP. And I'd like to introduce first, we're going to hear from um, Dr. Crystal Ray Bai. She's a board certified pediatrician, assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics, and director of the Mother Baby Unit at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, she is a fellow of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, and she's also at ICAP, or the Illinois Chapter AAP, uh, the Illinois Chapter Breastfeeding Coordinator for the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as the co-chair of our Committee on Breastfeeding. And she was instrumental in co-authoring the Illinois Physician Statement on Breastfeeding and worked on the two previous baby-friendly hospitals in Cook County and Chicago where she educated physicians on the importance of uh, promoting breastfeeding and baby-friendly hospitals. So I, I want to turn over the uh, webinar to Crystal. All right. Well, Thank you, Crystal. All right. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am going to um, talk about the um, second phase, which is sort of like the planning phase or the um, development phase. The first thing that you're going to find out when you get into the development phase, if you're not already there, is that um, you should form a multidisciplinary baby-friendly committee, or as baby-friendly like to say, your MDC. Um, there are essentially five um, subcommittees or subgroups within your MDC, um, the policy subcommittee, the training subcommittee, the practice subcommittee, um, continuity of care subcommittee, and then a subcommittee on the marketing of breast milk substitutes. When you get material from Baby Friendly, um, it really breaks things up into steps and work plans based on these committees. So we're also going to, I'm also going to sort of um, go through my part that specifically targets what each subcommittee does um, during this development phase. The first is a policy subcommittee, which pretty much addresses step one on is have a written breastfeeding policy. So if you have already a breastfeeding policy, you may need to rewrite it. Um, if you don't have one, you need to write a new one. Um, you know that this year, many of you probably know that this year went into law um, that all birthing hospitals must have um, a, a uh, hospital breastfeeding policy. Um, and um, so if you, we have to do it by Illinois state law. And so if you're going to write one, you might as well um, write one that adheres to the baby-friendly criteria. It must address all 10 steps. Um, you, there are several templates available. Baby Friendly USA has one. The Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine has one. The state of New Jersey actually published one and published a paper saying that um, we have a policy statement that has been used in every hospital um, in New Jersey who has become baby friendly. This policy statement has been used and is acceptable to Baby Friendly USA. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, you just, the, I will tell you that the templates and the way they do it are a little bit awkward. We did not use these templates. Um, we, um, because they basically go through every step and they say step one, here's what you need to do. Step two, here's, here's how our policy addresses step one. Here's how our policy addresses step two. Um, within our hospital that sort of um, a template wasn't really going to work. Um, so we just adjusted it to, to um, fit with what our hospital is used to, but also make sure that it addresses all 10 steps. They do give you a checklist, um, and you want to use that checklist, because when the reviewers later on, I'll talk about how, you know, what they do with all this information, but somebody will review that policy, they will use the checklist 
to make sure that every single thing on that checklist is addressed. Um, you want to review other policies in the hospital that affect um, mothers and babies. Um, this is other, other policies, not just feeding policies. This might be um, birthing policies. This might be policies around bathing. It's any kinds of policies that um, affect moms and babies. You want to review them and make sure that they adhere to baby-friendly um, steps. You um, want to touch base and form and involve other department heads, such as pharmacy, dietary, the Department of Medicine, Department of Emergency Medicine. Um, these are other places, other departments that touch mothers and babies um, that you want to inform and that they suggest that you um, get involved with the baby-friendly process. Sometimes just informing them, hey, we're doing that, doing this. Um, like in medicine, um, other places like in the pharmacy, the dietary, you really want their input, you really want their help. Um, you want to determine a plan for how you're going to disseminate the policy to all hospital staff, and you're going to decide on which summary of the policy for posting in key areas um, serving the babies is going to be used. So part of your requirement is that you have to post the baby-friendly steps in the hospital, sort of like a lay version of it. Um, and there's a number, again, don't reinvent the wheels. There's a lot of different versions on, on, um, online and through Baby Friendly, and you can just decide which one you're going to want to use, and you need that in English and Spanish. So step two um, is the policy, is the, the training subcommittee. That involves training all staff, and the, the, your prenatal staff, your LMD staff, um, and your postpartum providers and staff. Um, develop a plan to provide the necessary training, um, Patrice is going to talk a little bit more about the training, that you, several options are available, you want to review which is best for your situation. Um, I suggest taking advantage of whether you have, there are online modules, there's also LMS or, learn, if you have a, an LMS or a learning management system within your hospital, I strongly advise you to try and take advantage of that. And then you develop a training schedule, that's it for training. Your practice subcommittee, that has a, a big chunk. Um, after policy, I think practice probably has the biggest chunk because it addresses steps four through nine, um, helping mothers initiate breastfeeding within the first hour, which Baby Friendly has really converted it to skin to skin. Um, so that involves babies that aren't just breastfeeding, but all babies. Um, show mothers how to breastfeed and maintain lactation if separated. Give newborn infants no food other than or food or drinks other than breast milk unless medically indicated. Um, practice women in, encourage breastfeeding on demand, and give no artificial feature pacifiers. For the, and this, um, this sub, subcommittee really examines what are the current um, protocols and procedures for each step. Um, they might, you might need to prepare new or revised protocols or procedures as necessary. You want to examine what your current practices are related to breastfeeding education and assistance, um, and then revise or develop your inpatient um, education plan. They identify what the facility challenges are um, and solutions for implementing and try and come up with solutions for implementing um, these plans. Decide on what the method for implementation will be. Will it be, you know, um, given, you know just um, doing education? Will it be sort of like a big bang, everything at once? Um, and then you want to develop a data collection plan because you want to know what are your skin-to-skin -skin rates, for example, before the implementation and what are your skin-to-skin -skin rates after your implementation. This slide, I restated um, what the steps are that the practice of committee um, addresses. And then in red, you see the three that most hospitals have the most difficulty um, tackling. These are three that really um, requires a huge culture change, um, not only for the staff, but also for the providers. Um, giving newborn infants no food or drink other than breast milk. Obviously, this is breastfeeding babies. Um, no food or drink other than breast milk unless medically indicated. Um, this can be a very huge culture change, something difficult, requires a lot of education for your providers and staff. Practice rooming in if you don't have couplet care already. Um, that can, that's also a big culture change for the nursing staff. Um, and sometimes just, um, you know, your, whole, your hospital setup is a challenge to figure out how is your hospital set up? How are we going to make it so that we're no longer using this nursery and cohorting babies in the night or at some point during the day um, and we're really practicing rooming in? And then nine is give no artificial um, seats or pacifiers. Um, that's also a big challenge. Um, the continuity of care committee that addresses steps three and step 10. 
Step three is to inform all pregnant women, pregnant and postpartum women about breastfeeding. You're going to review all of the educational material um, to pregnant and postpartum women. Um, Baby Friendly gives you a list of what needs to be covered. So you want to evaluate if all the required topics are covered, evaluate um, if what you have is current and evidence-based, and then evaluate that it's free from commercial interest. The big thing for Baby Friendly should have no branding. Your educational material should have no branding. Review and revise all necessary, uh, as necessary, all materials given to pregnant and postpartum women. Review the timing of prenatal breastfeeding education. Work with your prenatal providers and say, you know, you don't talk about breastfeeding at every visit, although that would be great. But let's say visit, you know, your visit at 18 weeks and you visit at 36 weeks, that's when you're really going to focus on breastfeeding, you're really going to talk about breastfeeding. Um, and then considering a method for documenting the education, because you do want to document that that education, both prenatally and postnatally, that it was done. Ten steps, um, I mean, step ten is to foster the establishment of breastfeeding groups. Um, and this is just to foster the establishment. You don't necessarily have to have one. Um, identify community organizations and practitioners that interact with pregnant and postpartum women that, who deliver in the facility. Um, so survey them to determine what types of information they provide um, to pregnant and postpartum women about breastfeeding. Invite them to participate. You know, if you want community engagement, you really want to invite them to participate um, in your multidisciplinary committee. Um, and then your International Code of Breast Milk Substitutes. Um, this is a, also a big challenge for a lot of hospitals um, because this is where you talk about not just the branding but also um, the purchase of formula and how do you get that formula. Um, Baby Friendly will tell you that the purchase of formula is one of the last things you do. So a lot of this is a lot of planning for when you're finally going to purchase the formula. Um, and so you're going to review what your infant feeding um, and vendor policies are. How do we get um, how do we get formula from the vendors? How, when do they come? Develop a plan to identify and remove all promotional items, educational items um, provided by manufacturers and distributors of breast milk substitutes. That means all your posters, all your pens, all your um, you know badges, all of your mouse pads, all of that has to be gone. Develop a plan for determining the accurate amount of infant formula currently utilized within the facility. How much do you actually give out? How much is used for feeding babies? And how much just walks out the door for moms? Like, oh, here's a few packs um, to make, help you make it through the weekend. Um, work with receiving and materials management to develop a plan for acquisition and dissemination of the formula under these new policies. So that you don't have, you're not using as much formula because A, you're implementing all these steps, but also because of the culture change, you're not giving you know, patients two days worth of formula to walk out the door until they make it you know, to their WIC appointment or they make it you know, to the pharmacy the next day or to, the, to Target or Walmart um, the next day. The other thing that I didn't put in the slide that I have time to mention is Baby Friendly will tell you that you also need to be careful of um, and come up with a plan to how are you going to assure that the formula you're getting is not going to expire before you use it. Um, there's a lot of talk um, and it's become clear that the formula companies will give you, give the hospitals that are baby friendly formula that is very close to the expiration date um, and you want to be very careful about that and that also should be in your, um, within your policies is how you're going to address that. The very last step um, is you're going to submit your breastfeeding policy and this can be done in a mass or it can be done piecemeal, you can do one at a time your breastfeeding policy, your work plans, and all of your training plans um, to Baby Friendly. And Baby Friendly gives you templates for all of this, so you don't have to reinvent it. Um, and then they, you submit it, they give you feedback, um, and then you're approved um, to move on to the dissemination. So, um, now we're going to have. Go ahead, Mary. Mary. Now we're going to have um, Patrice Perez, who's the um, my patient consultant here um, at the University of Illinois, and she is going to talk to you guys um, about um, the dissemination phase. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Glad to be here. And once you've submitted all your plans from the developmental phase and you receive approval, you'll be designated to go into the dissemination phase. 
And that, it, you'll see our game board shortly, and then you'll understand why I'm referring to these two game board pieces. But the two that are um, germane to dissemination are to train the staff and collect the data. It sounds like two simple pieces, but they're, they can be very involved. Training the staff is going to be one of the biggest challenges because every uh, nursing staff member in the labor and delivery and the mother-baby unit must receive at least the 15 objectives from the um, World Health Organization and, um, oh, I forgot the other one, UNICEF, and also five hours of clinical. So there's a lot going on here with this 20-hour class. And that can, that can sound very expensive, but we'll talk about a couple of ways that you can keep that a little bit lower. One of the options you'll have is to use online education. Because as long as you're demonstrating that you have met the objectives from the UNICEF WHO um, objectives, then you'll be OK. So if you want to use learning packets, if you can purchase online programming, you uh, also individual education or seminars or CLC training can be utilized. You simply have to match up the objectives of the pro course or program with the object objectives of the 20-hour class. And if so, then document that that individual has completed it. They will be auditing that information when you reach the end of the line and they come and do their final evaluation. So you do want to have that available. Um, must you use or purchase the curriculum that's available from Baby Friendly? I think that's kind of a concern for a lot of people. No, you don't have to do that. Again, it's all related to the objectives. You can use whatever means or modes you have available to meet those objectives. It doesn't have to be additional cost. Their program is, is fine, and it's not hideously expensive, but you, know, you do have other options in that regard. Must you demonstrate and have documented the 20 hours of education inclusive of the UNICEF WHO um, guidelines and the five supervised clinical hours? Yes. They will be looking for that. So 80% is the threshold. So in all of these evaluation parameters, when they do come, and this is you know, toward the end of, this, of, of your journey, they will be looking for at least a, a threshold of 80%. It has a, you know, do you have to be perfect? As Eileen would say, no, but you have to be close. OK, must the MDs, CNMs, and APNs providing direct patient care have three hours of documented education? Yes. So you need to figure out what program you're going to do that um, is going to hit the highlights of what you need those providers to make sure they're giving their patients in that three-hour window. And in documenting your education, you can use several modalities. You can use personnel files and re include records in those. If you're fortunate enough to have LMS, they will, that will generate a report so that you can see who's taken the course and what their scores were and did they, how many of they accomplished and what their passing rate was. So that's very easy. Some places use a simple Excel file checklist type of arrangement. But again, 80% is the threshold in terms of um, being able to go forward that has to have received their education. Techniques that we've tried, um, that we're in process of using at you know, UIHHFS is uh, patient scripting. We're trying to get that script starting in the prenatal clinic and going through to postpartum so that the message is consistent and the message is the same. When the surveyor asks that patient, did anyone talk to you about exclusivity in breastfeeding? They will say, oh, yes. Did anybody talk to you about the benefits of breastfeeding? Yes, they did. So they want to, it, we want to be like a broken record, basically. Unified written materials. And again, we're talking about going through antepartum to postpartum. Um, creating our own documents that then can address those objectives and, and be unified. Uh, as Crystal mentioned, we cannot any longer use the freebies. And if you read the fine print uh, in the, um, the information you'll get from Baby Friendly, that includes pump companies. I, I imagine there'll be some questions regarding that. But uh, it's not just formula company uh, stuff that, they, that we used to give out. We're not able to give out the educational materials provided by pump companies either. So you need to start thinking about how you're going to create your own handouts. Review documents and where will you chart all of this. So in the prenatal clinic, where will they be able to pull it up that the patient was taught these things? At postpartum, where will that be found in the charting that the patient was taught the, the um, required elements? If you have 
uh, electronic medical records, you may be you may have the ability to capture those required items, and that would be awesome. Uh, if you're considering electronic medical records, this would be one really good reason to have them because you could build all that in. LMS for competencies, education, and record keeping is a blessing. If you have that, it's an awesome thing to work with. And then collecting the data. You'll be doing QI projects, um, and, I'm, and I'm kind of dovetailing in on this with the Joint Commission because they've recently added that as one of their core measures. So electronic, electronic medical records, of course, is you know, kind of the standard these days. If you have that, you're able to capture these statistics and write in what you need. But some of us aren't quite there yet, and so we're doing some manual collection. This is a sample of a, a collection tool that um, one of our statisticians in my department created for me so that I can use this on, both on a monthly basis. If you look at the bottom in the colorful little tabs, you'll see that it's, I've got it monthly, and then at the end of the month, I can go ahead and fill in for the um, complete month so that it'll do the year at the end of the year. Because this is the kind of data that when the Joint Commission visits and wants to see your information on core breastfeeding measures, they're going to be looking at. And a lot of that is very similar to what you want for the baby friendly. She also created for me this daily um, data collection tool that I use to collect the postpartum information. Uh, when they're discharged, who's exclusively breastfeeding, mixed feeding, all formula feeding, who's pumping for um, NICU. It also allows some other uh, functions of my job, so it's a great record-keeping mechanism for me, but it's also very good for getting that data that I can fill in on that previous screen. Okay, but if you Google this, there are numerous collection tools, both online and in materials that you would be getting from the Joint Commission or Baby Friendly, so you take advantage of that. You don't necessarily have to sit down with an Excel file and completely make up your own. There's a lot out there. <clears throat> so as far as that goes, just as I said, many examples are in the literature and in materials, but you've got to remember that you want to reflect in your charting and in your data collection that we taught formula, a correct formula preparation for those mothers choosing to exclusively formula feed. We discussed the benefits of breastfeeding. We discussed exclusivity. They were taught manual expression. That's kind of a bigger one, a new one. We've talked a lot about skin to skin, rooming in, but the manual expression, that's one you know, that I'm finding, I'm incorporating that into my teaching now at the beginning of the year. And I, I find myself having to remind myself about it a lot because it's something we didn't routinely do, but now I'm trying to make that part of the practice. All these things are what they're going to be looking for when they survey you. Um, as far as the support group requirement, I think, again, there's a little bit of um, question about that. It's great to have a support group throughout your own facility, but the, the requirement is simply that you provide information on available support groups to the postpartum mothers. So if you are unable to or you don't have a, a outlet for a support group where you are, as long as you are aware of who's in your area that moms can get to if you provide that information for them, then that will be meeting, that will satisfy that criteria. And then don't forget, the tricky ones again are the purchasing of formula, compliance with the Intermar International Code of Marketing, and that's really hard for those of us who've been doing this many, many years. Um, we loved our badge holders and our free pens and, you know, all of that's got to go. And now I'm like the, you know, the crabby person in the unit going, uh, here, I'm going to trade you my badge holder for your uh, Similac badge holder, give me that. So uh, they, they just love seeing me coming. The reps cannot talk to the moms. There are no samples that can be provided. And any materials promoting breast milk substitutes, pacifiers, bottles, or nipples cannot be displayed. It, my takeaway for this segment would really be um, you can never, it's never too early to start thinking about how you can execute these requirements. I'm kind of a logical thinker, or at least I like to think I am, and so it was hard for me to, to jump ahead and be like, well, we're not at that step yet. But in reality, you should, it's like, well, we're just going to do it. As Nike says, just do it. We're just going to start doing this. And by the time we get to that point, the culture will start to change. It, and also, you'll give an opportunity to see where the kinks are and work them out. The sooner you start, the faster it will start to become habitual, cultural, and 
you'll start to see a change in the staff. I, I can only tell you that's what, really what we're seeing here. And um, they can be tough nuts to crack, so I'm glad we got going in a hurry. But the person that can really enlighten us on how this journey goes and how it winds up is Eileen Murphy. And she is up next. Um, we're sorry, everyone, uh, for some reason we got cut off, um, and so I didn't get to introduce Patrice. Did you um, say anything about yourself? I did. Okay, good. And I just want to say both you and uh, Chris, uh, Dr. Ravi has, have been instrumental, of course, at University of Illinois in uh, moving through the baby-friendly hospital designation process. So um, you are really um, great experts, as is Eileen Murphy, um, who is the next speaker. And I just want to say that um, we have been rooting for our little company of Mary Hospital to get their designation. And I think everybody um, in the whole state was so excited um, that you did finally get it. Um, so she is a wonderful resource as well. And um, at Little Company of Mary, she has uh, worked in the mother-baby nursing um, unit since 1989 and um, was um, the coordinator, the co-coordinator of the Baby Friendly Hospital designation process. So she brings a great deal of uh, expertise as well to this process and has wonderful perspective. So I'd just like to turn it over to Eileen. Thanks, Mary. Um, good afternoon, everyone. 12 minutes. OK. So here's the game board <laughs> in bright colors for you that Patrice was referring to as far as discovery, development, dissemination, and I get to talk about um, designation in the purple section. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, and I'm going to uh, go through the steps, but in, in accenting on support, the support, what sort of support, barriers, and what were the easiest things to do um, during our process. Um, just a little tidbit, uh, Baby Friendly has been in the USA since 1997. Worldwide, it was started in 1991. And currently, as of today, there was 153 designated baby-friendly hospitals in the USA, and that's in 34 states. And that 6.7% of births occur in baby-friendly hospitals in the United States. And that's our new hospital. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> we just moved in October 24th, 2012. Um, so designation. To attain uh, baby-friendly designation, we need to implement all these 10 steps. Um, and then uh, as far as having a survey team uh, determine that we have the 10 steps in place, and they do that by doing a phone interview assessment. So you basically have the entire assessment done on the phone before they come because they don't, they, when they do come out, they, they do want you to pass and be ready to pass. So they will do, do a uh, phone assessment, and then there's some things you might need to work on before they actually come out um, to see us. And then as far as the actual assessment, when they come out, we did have two assessors come out this past June to the hospital, and we also got to have um, a third assessor assessing the two assessors. So we had three people looking at all of our uh, data. Um, they will, as uh, Patrice had mentioned, on all the aspects, you're, they're looking for 80%. So in the academic world, you use a high C or a low B. Again, they're not looking for 100%. We strive to do 100% on everything to be sure we met the 80%. Um, but the actual uh, requirement is meeting uh, all the steps in, in 80%. Um, at our hospital, um, we have about 100 births a month, so 1,200 births a year. And um, the other important part of this is, as Patrice had mentioned, is the consistency of education um, as much prenatally for your patients um, and also for your staff so that the patients are able to answer the questions of the assessors appropriately. Because as far as in interviews, they talked to 10 staff nurses between uh, mother, baby, and labor and delivery. And they spoke to four physicians between family practice, pediatrics, and obstetrics. And they spoke with our one uh, midwife. So that's 15 staff members that they spoke with as far as um, the survey. But they spoke with 38 patients. So it really, they really want to see if the message is getting to the patient. So it's great if um, the staff is aware, but it has to be, it has to get to the patient, or you definitely will not pass. Um, so the consistency of education, and the other part of that is the 
documentation. Because if a patient cannot remember, which is perfectly uh, possible considering they delivered a baby and they might be exhausted and on medication, they, um, they'll go to the uh, documentation to see uh, if the mom says she can't remember. So that's also, if you have user-friendly charting in the hospital system, that's also very helpful. Um, and so as I go through the steps, I'm just have a little uh, icons for support barriers. And the third one you could tell there is the easiest. So step one, as uh, Crystal had mentioned, is definitely easy as far as getting the policy together in that you can just basically copy one. The hard part is actually implementing and practicing it. So actually doing the policy is not that difficult. Um, step two, we have support and a lot of barriers with um, education. We started this whole process in um, 2008. So we started our education in 2008. We did purchase the material from Baby Friendly. It was a curriculum and a PowerPoint. Um, and we started with two lactation consultants. That was our entire committee of all those committees that Crystal mentioned. That was a party of two for all of that. So um, we did the eight-hour classroom with all our staff over many days, and then an eight-hour clinical with all our staff, and also some online um, training. The big part of support that helped with this for us was training as of this state now we have 17 of our mother baby uh, labor delivery and NICU staff are certified lactation counselors also. So this is very helpful to have their support throughout the evening shift and the night shift. Um, also continuing every, you know, they're a resource for the other staff also uh, because of their CLC background. Um, also the Bridges to Breastfeeding program, which is throughout the state, was, we hosted that in uh, November 2010, which we got to include our staff along with um, our local WIC office staff came, so coordinating with them. And then uh, we did get to start a work group um, in 2011. We got to start a work group, which incorporated uh, more supportive staff. Um, barriers for us is, again, with, with physician, physician education, our physicians were supportive, and they were um, saying, great, go right ahead and do it, and, but we really needed them to complete the education. That was one of our uh, difficult areas to cover. Um, and also just our staff practicing consistently. It wasn't just, oh, we have to be baby friendly today. We're going to be baby friendly always. So those were some of our barriers in there. And as Patrice mentioned, we did make scripting pocket guides for all our staff and physicians. And um, our entire hospital had to be trained also as far as it's a baby-friendly hospital. It's not just when you're on one unit that it's baby-friendly. So we did make a, um, with our online hospital system, it's called, for us, it's Performance Manager. We did make an all-hospital-wide competency. Um, and specifically, and actually 96% of our hospital staff completed that competency, which was great. And um, specifically for people that come into our department, medical records, lab tech, environmental services, security, transport, volunteers, they all have to be aware of what it means that we're baby friendly. And if they don't understand, we just say either be supportive or be quiet, because that's the main thing that we need them to do so that the patients don't hear any um, remarks that aren't evidence-based uh, information. Another um, helpful part of this in general was doing a monthly staff recognition for positive reinforcement. Part of our staff um, uh, they would vote every month. They would submit nominations of someone that they caught doing a positive baby friendly, going above and beyond and baby friendly, and then they were recognized um, each month. And then we also did some little raffle prizes for them. And they were very, very excited about that. So that was fantastic. Um, again, I mentioned about WIC involving our local WIC, again, with prenatal and then using um, other resources, that uh, perinatal network, breastfeeding task force, sorry, um, as far as outside support and again with sharing information and educational ideas. Um, step three, the big part for this was hiring a peer counselor in October of 2011. Um, as far as educating our patients who are responsible for our clinic that's actually in our hospital, we have um, Dana Posley who's been working uh, in our clinic, in our clinic's 100% Medicaid population, 90% um, African American, which has the lowest breastfeeding rate. So this is really um, a, need, a need to inform and educate our patients. And even if the patients were not inter are not interested in learning about um, breastfeeding, they are still in educated on the baby-friendly hospital practices of skin-to-skin, -skin, rooming in, 
Um, we do not have carry pacifiers and things like that, whether or not they wanted to breastfeed. But luck, Dana has been doing such an awesome job because when she started, our breastfeeding rates for the clinic patients was in the mid-30, low 30 percent, and now is almost 77 percent with just of the basis of education and informing the patients. Um, so we're pretty proud about that. Um, step four, again, is skin to skin. Again, this is regardless of their feeding choice. And um, definitely hats off to our labor and delivery department and our CLCs that really um, got this moving pretty well, thank goodness. And also, we chose one nurse who's, as Patrice kind of said, a, a, a tough person. And we put her in charge of audit auditing every delivery. We gave her a job, and she took it very seriously. And she hounded down everyone auditing every delivery about skin to skin. So again, using your resources and support. Um, our OBs and our pediatricians were also very supportive about skin to skin. Um, the barrier came for us with uh, changing the policy and procedure for the babies to stay in labor and delivery and not go to the nursery. So again, over the course of two years, we uh, got rid of that most of that barrier. We also have um, marketing helped us out with uh, posting this at the entrance to the labor and delivery area skin to skin banner. And then um, step five, I have under support and easy because uh, we pretty much with the CLCs again, helping um, educating the patients and also being a resource for staff. Am I over time? No, you're good. <laughs> hand, um, also about hand expression. Um, we did all our CLCs. They did a hand expression competency with um, all of our staff. We assigned each CLC a few staff members to hit maybe three or four of each, spread it out that way to make sure everyone was reviewed and ready to go. As far as when they're separated, we have um, a relatively small NICU, um, 10 beds. Uh, so our NICU staff is excellent with approaching every mom of any baby that's admitted with um, informing them about at least pumping breast milk for their baby, even if they're not interested in actually directly nursing their baby. And uh, we have forms for them to fill out to keep tabs on that, too. So that was very helpful. Step six was definitely very, very, very difficult, continues to be difficult um, with exclusivity. And again, the barrier to that would be our, our staff, us, our, our physicians and the patients. It's a combination of patient education and, again, with prenatal um, education uh, through that's, that's where it's at. So they're prepared to keep that baby with them in the room, to keep feeding the baby, keep the baby skin to skin. So that's, a, that's huge. And again, that's a whole culture change. Um, and especially when family members come in, it can even get more difficult with us trying to explain that. Um, part of code, uh, excuse me, part of Step six is the code, and uh, which has been around since 1981. I'm always amazed it's been around since 1981. And that, um, again, we got rid of our marketing bags in 2008, and that was very easy. They just stopped bringing them, and then we just threw everything else away that we found. Through Nothing usually creeps up anymore, thank goodness, as far as um, marketing. Rooming in, we started mother baby care, couple of care in 1989, which is when I started. So as far as keeping the babies together, that wasn't, that wasn't too hard, but it does take a lot of support. Um, the lab techs come to the room, the newborn screening is done in the room, the pediatricians come to the room now, so it's a diff little bit different in policy and procedure. We do the hearing screenings in the room, uh, phototherapy in the room. If the baby is on a, has a hep block and on antibiotics, the baby's in the room with the mom. Uh, barriers, of course, would be night shift. It's very difficult for the patients and therefore the staff. Again, prenatal education and letting them know they can have a support person with them 24 hours a day is also helpful. Um, and our rooming in poster there. That's a, at the entrance to the unit. Um, step eight, feeding on cue. Again, this is difficult. People want to schedule the baby. The baby's three hours old. They want to put them on a schedule. It's very difficult. It goes back to practicing um, best breastfeeding management with education. Um, and so that's why I put a little barrier there. It's staff, physician, and patient. Um, step nine was very difficult for us because everybody wants to give the baby a formula in a bottle as a supplement when mostly we'll use um, cup feedings if it's medically indicated and also discuss with the mom um, that uh, exclusivity if it's not medically indicated. Pacifiers was extremely easy because we don't carry pacifiers, so um, that was easy. We do have them in the NICU, of course. We don't use them for healthy term babies, whether they're formula feeding or breastfeeding. We don't have them in the hospital. 
that was the easiest thing to do. We let them know their baby's learning to eat, and that's what they need to do while they're here. Um, the goal, we just let them know, is to get them off to the best start possible. And we haven't had too many complaints. Some people bring them in, and we just document that we told them, you know, it's not recommended at this time. And step 10 is my absolute favorite. We uh, got to start a weekly breastfeeding support group six years ago, and we just started a monthly evening group. We do also refer them to the local, there's two La Leche League meetings in the uh, area, so we refer them to that. Uh -huh. And that means I'm supposed to know. Okay, and then this is, I, I put together from our breastfeeding support group when we started it, when people remind me that nobody came at the beginning. Um, as of this year, we've had over 400 family visits. So um, it started out barely 150. So that's um, encouraging. Of course, you see the jump between um, when we started 2008 and 2009, when we were really pushed, you know, started with the education of baby friendly. So that's good. Um, and then there's many, many reasons to go baby friendly. I, I just like to comment on improved health outcomes for mothers and babies would be number one. Uh, you can read the rest of those, but that's. That is it. Um, and like Patrice said, just do it, and it's because it's the right thing to do. And, and, that leaves us time for questions. and then we'll have time for questions. Here's the rest of the reasons to go baby friendly. Um, from summing it up, as I'd say, one thing is that I'm extremely proud of our staff, physicians, and patients, even though we present our, we are the barriers, <laughs> the staff, physicians, and patients. But um, the recommendation, I would say, is get a physician champion. <laughs> in your system. Our head of pediatrics was um, very helpful um, at uh, working with us when he could. Um, and also in your work group and all these committees that uh, Crystal has spoken of, get a, try to get a variety of people in there from all different departments, labor and delivery, um, NICU, mother, baby, and also, um, you know, we try to get our midwife in or anyone from anywhere, dietetics, um, somewhere, and other pharmacy, different departments, if you can get them to come in time to time when they're available. Okay, and our goal, of course, the goal is to increase initiation, duration, and exclusivity. And uh, this is wh where we're headed. It's slowly but surely going up. So hopefully we'll get a result for 2012 soon. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Crystal, Patrice, and Eileen. I think that was uh, very um, interesting and, and detailed overview of kind of the process and, and how it worked in, in your hospital. Uh, on the screen now, the attendees, you'll see uh, the contact information for Mary and myself here at ICAP. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions afterwards. Um, and uh, I also want to make sure to remind you that Illinois Maternal and Child Health Coalition is our partner in this, so there's another organization helping to provide this information. Uh, we have about 15 minutes almost for questions. So, if people on the participating in the webinar want to either type in a question on their screen or use the raise your hand icon to uh, be unmuted, you can just click that icon and we will um, unmute you and call on you if you have a question. We'd be happy to take a few questions. And while we're waiting for that, are, do any of the speakers want to add any more comment on each other's presentations or just, just add any more pearls of wisdom that you thought of while the presentation uh, I'll was add this. Um, I kind of feel bad now I didn't put my email down there because I'd be more than happy to um, communicate with anyone that has questions. I'm sure Eileen and Crystal would as well. So um, I don't know if, I mean, certainly we would be reachable through Mary or Scott. So um, e either that or I, I guess there must be some way we could send that out to people. Sure, and we will we'll make sure to let attendees know how to reach uh, the three of you as well. Uh, I should mention that a comment, a question did come in during the presentation. Will this be recorded and available? And it will be, and we'll send that out as well. Um, oh, excellent. I did have a question about that. Good. Uh, we have a question from Lindsay Smith. Uh, the question is, will nipple shields uh, still be used? I'm going to let you take that. We do, we do not have nipple shields in the hospital. So I'm giving it to Patrice. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm going to ask um, Eileen, did, was there any comment about that from Baby Friendly? No, actually, this is Eileen. Nipple shields have not, have not come up. Um, we, we don't carry them in the hospital. If a mom, again, if a mom brings it in, we'll work with her with it, but we don't have them as an item on our, um, our cart, MVC cart. Okay, I'll take it from um, U of I's perspective. We do use them, and my suspicion would be if you're promoting breastfeeding and the baby feeding at the breast, baby friendly wouldn't have a problem with that if it was necessary. 
and document it as such. But that raises a very good question, and we'll do some more research on that as well. Do you, you want to share any thoughts, Dr. Rivai? No, I mean, I think it's a good question. I think probably what they will look for is what are the indications. Um, right. If everybody gets a nipple shield thrown at them just because they're having some soreness as opposed to education to really assess the lats, then I would imagine that baby friendly would have an issue with that. There's nothing in any of the documentation um, of their evaluation that addresses nipple shield. Great question. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, while we're waiting for some more questions to come in, I'd like the participants on the webinar to start thinking about um, what their barriers are in their communities and in their hospitals um, so we can help you address that. I know some of the uh, We Choose Health grantees are really just at the very beginning stages in terms of getting their CEO support letters and starting to do their assessments and their appraisals. Um, others that are participating on the webinar, because this was available statewide, may be at very different places. but. Uh, we'd like you to start thinking about um, the challenges you're having so we can help connect you to others who've addressed those challenges or do additional webinars or put out resources on those issues. Um, I think that, uh, this is Mary. I would like to ask um, the three presenters um, to talk about buy-in from staff and resistance because I know that that was um, it's a big issue at every hospital. People are at different stages in terms of acceptance of baby friendly and promoting breastfeeding. So I think I will um, start with Eileen. What do you think the biggest barrier was in terms of buy-in from the staff at the hospital and um, how did you overcome that? Okay, this is Eileen. Just I guess ma mainly um, changing policies and the procedures as far as keeping the babies in labor and delivery and not having a, re a real nursery for the babies to go to. Um, that, that took two years, so I guess it was to get that squared away. So that's kind of the process. But again, we would, we would kind of choose certain staff members that maybe were more reluctant and go, oh, you could really help us out and kind of bring them forward. And like the, like the person that audited skin to skin and labor and delivery, she, she could be real powerful either in a negative way or a positive way. So we just went after her in a positive way, and it, it came out really, really well that she she worked really hard at the skin audit. So I, I guess, you know, trying to key in on the negative people that might be saying things behind your back and bring them front, front and center and give them a job. And, you know, and we also invited those people into our work group and to do the job. That helped a lot. That's great, Eileen. Thank you for that. Okay, um, Patrice, I'd like to ask you the same question um, in terms of buy-in at, at um, U University of Illinois. Can you talk well, about? Well, I'll be honest with you. I think that um, there's kind of a prevalent attitude that, oh, this is just going to mean more work. You know, that people just think this will be, you know, just creating more work for them, and um, they have already so many tasks that they're responsible for. Probably the most severe example I can give is one staff nurse who absolutely thinks this means we're forcing people to breastfeed. And so you have a, not only a barrier, but another educational opportunity in um, challenging people to understand that this is, we're not making people breastfeed. If they're going to formula feed, we want to make sure that they prepare that correctly. Um, you know, so that this is, you know, we've had some admits to our PICU with people that tried to stretch that formula. So this is very important, especially in these times. But the biggest thing is really, they always think, oh, now it's more charting, it's more this, it's more that. We're a little bit lucky in that we have a new EMR coming that's going to be all dropped down and it should address this very efficiently. But what I've seen is, despite all of this pushback, as we've, we've just forged ahead like, you know, too bad, too sad, we're just, this is how it's going to be, people have started to actually see the results. They've seen the results of skin to skin. They've seen the results of um, the successful breastfeeding. And it's kind of a trickle-down effect where there's starting to be, I don't know if momentum is too strong a word, but we're starting to see some more positivity, I think, in it. Great. Um, Dr. Rabai, um, from your perspective as a physician, what kind of um, buy-in issues were there with the other physicians at University of Illinois? Um, well, I know we really haven't had too many buy-in issues here. Um, you know, I think 
part of that, you know, I don't know if part of it is um, the fact that we're an academic health center or just that we're just luck of the draw that we have a number of um, physicians that, well, basically we don't have any naysayers, luckily. But, you know, Scott mentioned earlier I did um, help with some previous, um, doing some previous talks and in the previous grants going around to hospitals um, and talking to other physician groups, um, you know, family medicine, OB, and pediatrics about baby friendly. And I think one of the key things, which is what I mean, is that they need a peer who is going to be a champion. You need a physician champion and ideally one from within each subspecialty that takes care of the moms or babies. Uh, because when you, they have a peer, for somebody like, you know, for a lactation consult consultant or a nurse manager or whatever, as a physician they can say, oh, well, you know, I'm a doctor and you don't really understand from my perspective and so that's why every baby with bilirubin, every baby with jaundice has to have therapy, has to have um, formula. Well, if one of their peers alternatively says, you know, that's really not the case. Um, we, you know, babies that have jaundice don't need to be formula fed and they can be supported through it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're a little more likely um, to, to make those changes and to um, accept the changes. Um, I think that was a big impetus for why we decided to do all of those, um, go around and do all of those talks is because we knew that um, physicians really want to hear from physicians. Um, and so identifying who your physician champion is, I think, will overcome a lot of physician naysayers. Great. Thank you very much, Crystal. And I, I think that goes to the point of um, education, both for the staff and for the physicians at the hospital, and trying to dispel the myths that exist um, are really important. Um, I think we have another question. We have, we have a question here. Uh, with Baby Friendly, is there no time an infant could be in the nursery? Oh, that's a good, yeah, it's 23 out of 24 hours. Is there no time the infant can be in the nursery? For, for baby, this is Eileen, for baby friendly, um, they like to see, they like 80%, again, of your babies to be with the mom in the room for 23 hours of a 24-hour day, unless there's, um, you know, any medical reason that for on the mom or the baby. So if you have a mom that is too, you know, whether a fresh C-section who is medicated and does not have anyone with her, Yes, you can take the baby out of the room. You just document the reason that the baby's out of the room. Or if the mom requests that the baby be out of the room, you document the risks of having the baby out of the room um, from the mom that the baby won't be able to nurse because of the, and, you know, all the risks that are involved. And then you just um, document that. So you can remove the baby from the room, but they would like to see 80% stay with the mom. But there are always reasons, and you can document that. Okay, we have another question here. Are any of the hospitals partnering with or utilizing the WIC breastfeeding peer counselors to provide additional support to mom or baby in hospital after discharge, or in hospital or after discharge? Um, this is Eileen at Little Company. We work with our local WIC um, in the we, and the peer counselors um, in the WIC office. Also, they were invited and attended many of our educational um, opportunities at the hospital, and we. We do try to definitely work with them, and we do keep connected with our local WIC that's near us. As far as the University of Illinois goes, we have um, some volunteer peer counselors. They are not from a WIC. They're independent, and they function through the volunteer office. Our patients come from several WIC sites, uh, and we do have peer counselors at one of our major remote clinics clinic sites, so we do have that um, capability, but as we move forward, that's a great consideration. We may want to gather some information on which WIC sites our patients are most frequenting and reach out to those peer counselors. Great. Thank you very much for those answers. Um, it looks like we do not have any additional questions. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, we're certainly happy here at the Illinois Chapter of the AP or at the Illinois Maternal and Child Health Coalition to take um, any follow-up questions you might have afterwards. So please make sure to contact us. Um, I want to thank our three speakers. I think this was a really excellent presentation and, and gave a good overview. And, and they are going to be available, I'm sure, to help with other questions and answers in the future. We will be posting the presentation online. Uh, so we'll send the information out about that. Um, and with that, I'd, I'd just like to thank Illinois Department of Public Health again for their support of this effort. 
and encourage everyone to continue to work with us on this as they work at their hospitals over the next couple of years. So thank you very much, and this ends the webinar. Thank you. Thank you.